Welcome to Long Shots. This is the story of two brothers from the Midwest with nothing to lose, who created a tech empire and all the valuable lessons we learned along the way. Episode 1, Fence Jumper. When I woke up in the Monterey Peninsula Community Hospital on February 10th, 2017, I knew something had gone very, very wrong. But I felt great. The nurse would later explain my false sense of euphoria came from the morphine shot they'd given me when I was wheeled into the hospital three hours before. I'd sustained seven spiral fractures in my tibia and broken my knee in three places, jumping off a 10-foot high security fence. My surgeon would later describe my leg as a bag of glass. Just three hours earlier, I was parked outside a gated mansion with a minivan full of partygoers. We were hosting a gathering with Bill Murray on the grounds of the AT&T Pebble Beach Pro-Am for the golf line my brother Leo and I had created called William Murray Golf. I'd forgotten the gate code and the four rum and cokes I'd already had convinced me I should simply hop over the fence and trip the sensor on the other side to let everybody in. You know that trick. So I hopped up on the boulder and I pulled myself on top of a fence that buttressed the gate. At that very moment, it occurred to me that this wasn't the first gate I'd jumped in my life, and that none of my fence-jumping antics had ever resulted in a soft landing. One particular leap, however, had made my entire career, and despite the messy landing, it had been my lucky break. August 2008, Los Angeles, California. Seven years after moving from Fort Wayne, Indiana to Los Angeles to become an actor, I didn't have much to show for it. A handful of commercials, two failed pilots, and a guest starring role on a TNT show. My W-2s would tell you that I'd lived seven years below the poverty line. And aside from a brief stint of homelessness sprinkled in the beginning part, I'd never been more broke than I was in August of 2008. Before that August, I'd always managed to pay my rent on time, at least. I was at the end of my luck. I'd taken pride in never having to borrow money from any of my five roommates. I was living in a three-bedroom home on Rose Avenue in Venice Beach, California, which included my brother Leo and two cousins, Rick and Bob Phillip, also from Fort Wayne. A few miles east of Venice Beach in West Hollywood, there was a new show being cast from the writer and creator of Six Feet Under. It was a dark situational drama about a post-vampire society in Louisiana. Vampires had come out of the coffin and co-mingled with society thanks to a synthetic blood called True Blood. But this wasn't just any writer. This was Alan Ball. Alan 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 was the dark, delicious mind behind my favorite film, American Beauty, for which he'd won the Academy Award. The Oscar goes to... Alan Ball for American Beauty. But I also knew Alan had gotten his start in theater as a playwright. As a theater major myself, shout out to Hanover College, I'd performed a number of one-act plays Alan had written, including Bachelor Holiday and Your Mother's Butt. The thing is, I knew Alan was a theater junkie just like I was, and I'd heard a rumor he preferred classically trained theater actors on his sets. And at the very least, I was that. That True Blood audition was the hottest audition in the city. And for weeks, my agent Melissa had been working around the clock just to get the casting directors to look at me for the role of the squirrely town deputy, Kevin Ellis. I guess I just didn't have enough credits to get me in the door, but I thought I could play this role. If for no other reason than my only substantial TV credit to date was playing an innocent, dim-witted bank guard being robbed in an episode of Leverage, starring Tim Hutton. Mr. FBI guys, can you call me here? They were just sitting here. I am I? Look at this. It sounds strange, but I felt like I knew Alan through his plays. Alan's writing, even in its most somber moments, was still layered with humor. Alan's prose had a bouncy cadence, even if the topic was death, as it often was. The character I would be auditioning for was always showing up at a murder scene too late to be useful for anybody, and I thought, I think I can make a murder scene funny. Also, and mostly out of desperation, I'd started sneaking into auditions with the help of my agent. 
Online casting databases were still a few years out, and casting directors still relied on analog casting call sheets to fill out their auditions. Here's how it worked. My agent would tip me off to an audition location and time. I'd sneak into the audition, fill out my name, and hand over my headshot with confidence. The casting director would reference my name against the call sheet and, if my name wasn't there, they'd often think it was an oversight and just pencil my name in. Honestly though, that was even rare. Most of the time they just added my headshot to the pile and called me in without ever cross-referencing the call sheet at all. So in late August of 2008, my agent called me at 11.30 a.m. and told me about the True Blood audition. This was the pilot episode. The big one. My agent was 75% certain that the audition for Kevin Ellis was at 12.30 p.m. So, I guess I had about 10 minutes to get dressed and get out the door. Melissa also didn't have the sides for me either. Not her fault, but... um. Would have been nice. For all you non-actors out there, sides are pages from a script that a casting director gives to actors to study prior to their audition for the role. I was flying blind. But the real issue was sneaking into the studio lot itself, which is actually called the lot. I, I guess the proper name is the lot at Formosa. Anyway, the lot was famous for filming Some Like It Hot in Beverly Hills 90210. Today, it's home to shows like Euphoria and Big Little Lies. Because True Blood was the highest of high-profile auditions, the front gate was well-guarded and he had to present a driver's license to the guard, which he cross-checked diligently against the audition list. So, I would have to sneak in through the back, which presented its own set of complications. The back of the lot had no gate. It did, however, have a 12-foot-tall white wall that encircled the entire lot. But I had a friend. He was also a fellow audition crasher, and he had tipped me off that you could climb on top of a dumpster, then gain fixture on the wall, and pull yourself up so you could jump into the studio. He also warned me there was only about four feet of narrow space between the asphalt below and the soundstage. So basically, you had to pencil dive straight down and nail the landing, or risk being flung head first into a very sturdy soundstage. I parked in a back neighborhood and approached from the rear. It turned out my audition crashing buddy had great intel. The dumpster was right where it needed to be. I climbed up on top of the dumpster, I ignored the putrid smells of the chicken curry, and I hoisted myself to the top of the white wall. And I finally managed to stand up. At that moment, I realized, first, I was about 17 feet high. Second, I could see the entire studio from way up there. It was beautiful. And then I realized I was completely exposed to anybody who bothered to look up. It was now or never. No rent, and seemingly the only prospect to pay my rent was to be cast in the most sought after show in all of Hollywood. So I jumped and landed like a sack full of hammers. I brushed myself off and took inventory. My knees were scraped up and the palm of my hands were bleeding from the impact and black from the asphalt. I, I raced away and found a bathroom to like wash out the flecks of asphalt. But even when I looked in the mirror, I still looked like an old gym sock slung over a shower rod. But I was inside the Golden Gates, a total imposter, and I wasn't about to turn back. So I walked past the cafeteria and I found this white casita with a sign that had three letters on it. T-R-U. This must be the place. When I opened the door, it looked like any other audition. There was a sign-in sheet in front of me, a pile of headshots, all pretty standard audition protocol. So I signed in and put my bloody hands in my pocket and just kind of shuffled my feet. You know, act normal. Until I saw this woman approaching me quite deliberately. That woman was Junie Lowry Johnson. Junie had cast Six Feet Under, Desperate Housewives. Most recently, she cast the Showtime hit Yellow Jackets, which is really a triumph of modern day casting because each role has both a teenage as well as an adult version of the character. But Junie and Libby Goldstein pulled it off. Junie was, and still is, the best in the business. Junie approached, she stopped in front of me, and stated with zero hesitation, 
So, I know you don't have an audition today. I, I feign surprise. Yeah? Do you know how I know that? Asked Juni. No. Because these are the callbacks. Juni motioned to three actors sitting on the couch, all dressed in deputies' outfits, staring at me incredulously. I was outed, crushed, bloody, and defeated. And I remember looking at that room. It was that room where I would have been auditioning. It was like 10 feet away, but it might as well have been a million miles. I wanted to be in that room so badly. And then, almost on cue, the door opened and Alan Ball walked out of it. Alan started making a cup of green tea and Junie walked over him and they started having a little sidebar. Junie was whispering something in his ear and Alan was looking over his shoulder directly at me, sizing me up, which was bad because in my head, I looked a lot more like a murder suspect than a town deputy. But the jury was deliberating. And after what felt like an eternity, the judge, Alan, nodded his head and whispered something inaudibly to Junie and returned to the room. Junie took a deep breath and turned around. She had this bemused look on her face as she walked towards me to deliver the water cooler verdict. Alan would like to see you right now. Holy shit, lady, really? Really, right now. Everything in my shitty, insignificant acting life had led to this moment, this opportunity. The room was packed. It was small, it was stuffy. I mean, it was easy to see from everyone looking at their watches that they were ready to hit the cafeteria for lunch. And then I looked at Alan Ball and he was smiling. He was enjoying this. So, John, you snuck into the audition. I know you don't have the sides. So, improv it. Work the room. Nothing in the world scared me more than improv comedy. I hadn't even taken an intro to improv class in college. That's how much it terrified me. And I had to improv a script by the best writer in Hollywood. This was the kind of situation I had literal nightmares about. But I'd done my homework. I had read the Southern Vampire Mysteries, upon which True Blood is based, and the character of Kevin Ellis reminded me of one of my favorite fraternity brothers in college, George C. He was a farm boy with this thick Southern accent, with so little self-awareness it was almost charming. So, I chose my target. It was going to be Junie. I walked right up to her, and I looked her straight in the eye. You. You're suspect for murder, and murder is always a mistake. The stuffy room exploded with laughter. I honestly don't remember much after that. I went into some fused state of consciousness, but I remember one thing. I had crushed that audition. This time, I left the audition through the front gate of the lot bloody, but with my head held high. And driving back to Santa Monica on the 10 freeway only 30 minutes later, my phone rang. It was Alan. I knew he was legendary for calling actors himself to let them know that they'd been cast. I I never really thought that would happen to me. But he said, welcome to True Blood. It was difficult for me to hold back the tears while I thanked him profusely. I just remember looking down at the clock 1.30 p.m. And that was it. He just cast me right there in my Ford Taurus. In a crazy two hours, my entire life had changed forever. I have no idea how many exits I missed on my way home. I think I just kept driving to Malibu. I would shoot the pilot and go on to play Kevin Ellis for seven seasons until ultimately getting my head bitten off in the show's final season. Alan Ball taught me a valuable lesson that day that I carried with me forever. He gave me an opportunity to shine when no one else would. The Hollywood gatekeepers exist to keep you out, 
gates, guards, walls, no matter how pretty they are, they will always stand between you and the goal. But when I finally reached the final locked door, the last obstacle standing between me and the job I'd been seeking my entire life, a great man did the exact opposite of what the whole hierarchical system had trained him to do. He opened the door and let me inside. Alan Ball gave me a shot, and so did Junie. Thanks, guys. To this day, I can't remember an instance when someone sent the office a bottle of bourbon or put their resume on the back of a pizza box that I haven't at the very least called in for a personal interview. And that philosophy has benefited my businesses to no end. So thanks, Alan. And I was able to pay my rent in August. With $2,000 left over, I would invest it all one month later in a website with my brother Leo called thechive.com. It would take me 14 more years for that investment of 2,000 bucks to become over a billion dollars. I don't know what the Vegas odds on that would be. And I don't even know if I would have bet on myself. I mean, we only had the slightest chance of succeeding, but we did. And hopefully, how we manage to pull it all off will inspire everybody who's ever had the dream of something bigger. This is that story. This is Long Shots. Subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and give us a five-star rating. Go to thechive.com forward slash long shots to subscribe to our newsletter and see photos of all the events I talked about in the podcast today. Also, I do personally try to read all the emails we received. So if you'd like to reach out to the show, email me at longshots at thechive.com. Long Shots is hosted, executive produced, and written by me, John Rezig for Chive Media Group. Audio editing and sound design by Stephen Wilson. Tune in next Thursday for episode two of Long Shots.